Hey, happy Friday. Thanks for joining me. I'm Carla with Raised to Walk, and it's time for our weekly Bible study. And this week we are going to be studying uh, the book of Esther, and specifically chapter 4. But before we get started, a little bit about this Bible study. I host a weekly Bible study every Friday at noon central on Instagram Live at Raised to Walk, and then I upload that later to Raised to Walk TV. So if you can't join me live, you can always catch it on the replay on YouTube. Um, I also send out Bible study notes, so if you'd like a copy of those, you can go to raisetowalk.org forward slash notes, and I will send out um, I will send out a copy of the Bible study notes for the following week. Now, if you'd like to follow along in the reading, what we're doing is we're doing the one-year chronological Bible reading plan. You can go to my site, raisetowalk.org and search for the one-year chronological Bible reading plan and explains all about the plan itself, um, how the passages are arranged, uh, and also how you can follow along either um, through a physical Bible or uh, the YouVersion app also has a reading plan so you can follow along there in whatever uh, translation you prefer. So now that let's get started into our Bible study. So, so for the past several months, we've been studying passages where right before the Jews went into exile, we saw how, how God warned them repeatedly to repent and to confess their sins, to stay the judgment. Uh, we saw when they went into captivity, he was still telling them that they still needed to repent. And then we see, we saw last week that Daniel actually confessed the sins of his people and asked God to, um, to not only to forgive them of those sins, he confessed and repented of those sins for his people as a whole, but he also asked God not to delay his promise for allowing the Jews to return to the land because he read the words of Jeremiah, saw that they were going, that according to the words of Jeremiah, that the time was coming for the captivity to come to an end. And so he prayed to God that not to delay and to perform his promise for the glory of his own name. So anyway, so that was last week. Now this week we are shifting scenes just a little bit. Now actually this is taking place in the the same in the same sort of location. Um, Daniel was in the the Persian Empire at the time when he was praying that. And Esther is taking place in Chushan, the, the capital of the Persian Empire. But we are, our focus is shifting just a little bit because it's on the dynamics of the Persian court versus the, necessarily the Jews in captivity. So I'm going to set this up a little bit so you can kind of get a feel for what's going on. So the, the prophecy that, that Jeremiah gave, gave came to pass. The Jews... And when Cyrus became ruler, he allowed the Jews to go back to Jerusalem and to rebuild, start rebuilding the temple and the city of Jerusalem. However, when they got there, they ran into a lot of opposition. So in this past week, besides what we're going to be reading today, there was a, we covered a lot, we read through a lot of passages that talked about that, and talked about the opposition. And so I think this is a good example that even if there's something that is God's plan for us and God's will for our life because we know that it was you know it was the word of the word of God's prophet that the Jews were to return to the land and to rebuild rebuild the temple and to rebuild the city but it wasn't necessarily easy they still had a difficult time they had to persevere and press through and so they were going back to the land they were there was all this intrigue they were trying to people were physically coming against them then they were sending um sending bad reports back to to the persian rulers this went through uh, cyrus and darius and xerxes and and actually um artic xerxes to all through these these persian rulers they were trying to get them to saying that the jews were just going to rebel and trying to get this rebuilding of the temple to stop. So over in Israel, over in Jerusalem, all this is going on, all this opposition. So now we're in, um, we're in, in, in Esther, we're in back in Shushan, we're in this Persian capital 
And it's a story of, um, if you know this story already, it's sort of like the closest thing to a Cinderella story that we have in the Bible, but it's not really so much because what happens is this, this, uh, Jewish girl becomes the queen of Persia and saves her people from certain destruction, which sounds like an amazing story. So the book of Esther is actually the only book that does not mention the name of God in it. It's also the only book that was not um, found at the in, in the at Qumran and among the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it was one of the last ones to be approved as canon in the in the of the Jewish scriptures. So setting the stage, so this is what's going on in Jerusalem, and then in Persia, this is what's going on. So Cyrus had had become king, then Darius, and then after that, his son Xerxes. Now in the book, it's he's called Ahasuerus, and uh, so because of that, because they don't name him specifically, sometimes people will say it wasn't actually Xerxes, even though the, the timing of all the events you know, fits in. I actually found this really great journal article that explains the linguistic or, origins of Ahasuerus, uh, why they would have, the Jewish scriptures would have referred to him that way for the Greek name Xerxes. Um, it also talks about uh, about a lot of the other, um, like who his, who Vashti was. It's, it's a really, really interesting article and I'll list that in the video description. So the book of Esther starts with Xerxes as, as the king of the Persian empire. And he throws this huge banquet where he's inviting all the nobles and the rulers in and they have this, they have this feast and this banquet for 180 days for six months. And then at the end, he calls for his queen, Vashti, to come and show herself to all these party, party goers, and she refuses. And so in the story, his nobles advise him that um, if he lets this go, that every, no one's going to, all women are not going to respect their husband because she's been a, a bad example. And so he basically puts her away. She says she's no longer going to be queen. Now, it's not the same as if, like, he divorced her. It's not like she was, you know, gone and never seen again. Now, actually, his son, um, Arta, Arta Xerxes, was actually born, like, right after that. So she was pregnant during that time. And can you imagine being pregnant and not, and not wanting to go in front of a bunch of drunks? I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, that's very, that's a very uh, reasonable way to, to feel. Like you're not gonna not gonna want to do that. Just just think about all this pregnancy hormones going and getting some sort of absurd request like that. So anyway, regardless, she is she is put away. She's not uh, going to be um, have any power or influence as queen anymore. So doing a little bit of research about this, the now Vash. The Vashti is believed to be a mistress who is his, who is Xerxes actually the one that's recorded as queen. She was the mother, like I said, the mother of his his successor. Um, so normally the the queen is has to be one from one of the seven noble families of the the Medes and the Persians. So when you read in Esther, it actually gives the princes that are giving him this advice. So really that position of queen is part of this whole political maneuvering. So obviously whoever's family is, um, who's the queen comes from is going to have a position of power and influence. So probably part of this this desire to put have her out of the picture probably had to do with some political maneuvering as well. So Xerxes had had this campaign. He basically put away his wife. He goes to to Greece. He loses, and he comes back. And you can imagine what kind of a funk he's in now. In this um, in this journal article that I'm going to link to, the writer gives. A little bit of um, a picture of what else is going on. So I guess Xerxes also um, had an affair with 
like some relative's wife and it was just really kind of getting him causing all kinds of problems because of his philandering and you know he can pretty much do what he wants but it was it was causing issues so what happens is that he the his noble suggests that he has the Persian version of the bachelorette so all of these they gather all of these these girls from all the different regions of his country and they basically kind of have this not a contest but they come in and he pretty much sort of samples them like and sees who he likes the best out of all of them it really was kind of like the bachelorette so think of it this way it's like he's coming in they have just they have just lost they have um he's causing xerxes is causing issues with among his nobles because of he's sleeping with their wives so this is this beauty pageant is basically distracting Xerxes so he has all these girls coming in he's not gonna be having time to go mess with it with other people's wives hopefully and then it's also kind of a, um, a distraction for the people as well because you know this is a chance for these commoners to to have um, you know a place in the royal family so it's the, it's serving multiple purposes for this contest or this beauty pageant or whatever you want to call it so as we know Esther's chosen she's made queen and then we get to um, our reading this was actually from let me look here it was actually from September 14th so I'm not going to read through the whole reading of September 14th. So Esther was made queen. Mordecai overhears a plot to kill the king. And he reports that and basically saves the king's life. So this plays a role a little bit later after when, when everything comes down. So in Esther chapter 3, um, we enter into where, where the drama starts. So after these things, this is after Esther is made queen. This is after Mordecai has reported this plot. After this, um, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. Okay, imagine how much drama that would have started. Okay, because like I said, the princes of the seven families, they were supposed to be you know, right next to the king, and he puts Haman over them. And all the king's servants who were with the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him, but Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? Now when it happened, they spoke to him daily, and he would not listen to them. And they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, Haman was filled with wrath. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. So the whole kingdom includes Israel. So there's all this drama going on in Jerusalem with this opposition trying to stop the rebuilding of the temple and the city of Jerusalem. And then this is happening over in Shushan. And if this had gone through, then all of the Jews would have been killed. So this is coming this is coming in against them and the people in Jerusalem don't even don't even know what's going on at this point. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast Pur, that is the lot, before Haman to determine the day and the month until it fell on the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from all the other peoples, and they do not keep the king's laws. 
Therefore it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. If it pleases a king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed, and I will pay ten thousand talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it into the king's treasury. So the king took a signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamath the, the Haggite, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, The money and the people are given to you to do with them as seems good to you. Then the king's scribes were called on the thirteenth day of the first month, and a decree was written according to all that Haman had commanded, to the king's satraps, to the governors who were over each province, to the officials of all the people, to every province according to its script, and to every people in their language. In the name of King Ahasuerus it was written and sealed with the king's signet ring. And the letters were sent by carriers into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day on the thirteenth day of the twelfth month which is a month of Adar, and to plunder their possessions, a copy of the document was to be issued as law in every province, being published for all people that they should be ready for that day. The couriers went out, hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Shushan the citadel. So the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was perplexed. So in this starts chapter 4. When Mordecai learned that all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. Then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take a sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs, whom he had appointed to attend her, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. So Hathach went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and to plead before him for her people. So Hathach returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Then Esther spoke to Hathach and told, gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law to put all to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself had not been called to go into the king these thirty days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words, and Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do, you, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from the, for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. So Esther goes to the king, he holds out the scepter to her, and he asked her what her request is, and she asks, invites him and Haman to a dinner. And so they come. Haman's very prideful. He thinks he's, you know, he thinks he's it. And he goes back home and boasts to his family. And he says, the one thing that still bothers me is that Mordecai is my, my enemy is still sitting there. I don't want to wait. He didn't want to wait until the, uh, almost a whole year to see 
Mordecai dead. And so they plot to go have, they built a, he built a gallows and he goes and plots, planning to go to the king asking for permission to kill Mordecai. So at the same time while this is going on, the king can't sleep and he has the chronicles of his his acts as a king read to him and they come across the account that Mordecai saved the king's life. And so the king asked them, so what do we do to honor him? They said nothing. And just at that time, Haman comes in and the king asked him what he should do for someone that he wanted to honor. Now Haman is so prideful and he thinks, you know, he is, is so secure in his position that he gives us, but he's thinking that the king is talking about him. So he said, you know, put on your robe, get put on your ring and put, put this man on your horse and have someone lead him through the city saying, this is a, the man that the king delights to honor. And the king tells him to do that to Mordecai. So Mordecai comes, has to do this. He goes home. He's completely humiliated, but then he's going to Esther's banquet that evening. So in this this evening, the king asks Esther, you know, what is it? What is it that you want? You know, what is behind all this? Um, so at this point, Esther says, you know, my pe I and my people have been sold, you know, and are to be killed, and I'm pleading for my life. And he asks, who is this? And she reveals that she's a Jew, and he asks, who has done this? And she points to Haman. So the king is furious. He walks out. Haman falls across her couch. The king comes back in and he said, would he even assault the queen in my own presence? And they take Haman out and hang him on the gallows that he had made for Mordecai. So then after this, um, they can't reverse a decree, but they issue a counter decree that the Jews can fight back. And so the Jews overcame all their enemies that were out to attack them. So that's Esther in a nutshell. But what I, what I wanted to point out about this and what struck me this last time that I read it, Esther basically was there for a distraction. I mean, she, was, she had the title of queen. She was honored as queen, but Vashti was still you know, her son was the one that became ruler after Xerxes. And so she didn't have that position. She was basically there sort of as a figurehead. She didn't have a, a very political family to support her. She was just kind of off here to the side, but God had a plan for her. And when Mordecai told her this, she's like, well, what you can see in her response that it's like, well, what can I do? You know, I haven't even been, you know, the king hasn't even wanted me around for 30 days. You know, what am I supposed to do? And Mordecai tells her that maybe you've been put in, into the place for such a time as this. So she was basically a, you know, really, you know, she was seen as a pretty face. She was seen as a distraction. And that's probably how a lot of people saw her. But God had another plan for her. And I think that that shows us that whoever we are in whatever place that we're in, that God has a plan for us to use us. And this is, the whole book of Esther is just a perfect example of how God works through happenings. The other thing too is that Mordecai said, the Jews will be saved because God's made a promise to them and he will bring them through. But he said, if you don't step up to, I'm just paraphrasing, if you don't step up to what, to the position and the call God has on your life, he'll, he'll bring another, he will deliver them in another way, but you and your family will perish. And so I th think that every single day, God has a call for each one of us. And we choose to either follow that call, follow God's will, or stand back and let it pass us by. And so sometimes those negative consequences that we have in our life might be because we didn't step up and step into 
the call that God has for us. So that's enough for today. You know, if you have um, any thoughts or of, of what this passage says to you, I'd love to hear about it. You can just make a comment. We can have a discussion about it. Um, my Bible study today was a little, little late, and the reason is, is because we had flooding, not me personally, but we had flooding in my community from Imelda yesterday. And so last night, about 7, I got a text from my church, and they said, if you want to help, meet at 8 o'clock. And so you go in, they set you up, they put you in a group and give you an address and send you out. And so we've been through this, did this time, did it in May, and we did it in Harvey. It's getting to be a regular thing, which is not a good thing. And um, so we were, had an address and we we're going to be going out. And then they, I guess the homeowner had called back and said that they didn't want anybody coming out today. And they were going to give us, uh, so we had, they gave us another address that we went out to. And the thing is that, um, you know, when, when it floods, it's really important to get everything wet out fast, especially in Houston because it's so humid and you have to get the wet sheetrock and the wet dry uh wet insulation out because the longer it's in there the further up it soaks up you know the it's so absorbent it just uh, wicks up the water and um up the sheet work and the especially the insulation so it's super important to get it out fast and uh it's just i i can only imagine going through something like that that it's just so overwhelming but I also have noticed that a lot of times people have a hard time asking for help. And I think, like, when you're in a church, you, you learn how to, when you are asking other people to pray for you and when you're sharing the struggles that you're going through, you know, that and asking for prayer, it's, it's actually, you're learning a little bit of humility because you have to acknowledge like hey I don't I don't have everything together and you know and we do we all ask for prayer from each other and so I think when you're in um, a fellowship especially in a bible study or a, a small fellowship you learn how to do that and you know you're there for other people and and you learn that you know it's okay to ask for help it's okay to ask for for prayer for yourself because you know that you know you will do that for the person and they do it for you and that's part of being in a community and it's part of being in a fellowship but in general we're just we're so isolated and it's so it's so obvious when things like this happen because this is this is a traumatic experience it's a huge huge project this is you know when you have to clean out your and, and muck out your entire house, that's not a small project. I mean, even in the house that we went to today, they only had three inches. And they saved a lot of their furniture, a lot. And we still had, I don't know how many people we had, like eight people or something. And then we were there until 132, something like that. I don't remember. But anyway, it was... Um, all of us were working on that and you know and it took a while to get out and we were we had all the stuff too I mean because at this point you know my church like has the supply list down of what you need to muck out of the house but and at the man that didn't want us to come today I don't know maybe he was just overwhelmed and just wasn't ready to step forward or something I don't know but it's just it's too much for any one person to go through alone it's just way too much and then um we had a uh, a family friend uh, that flooded in May and then and after that I I asked my daughter like hey do they need help and she's like no they, they said they don't need help and I'm like okay you know and then um, they flooded again yesterday and when I was leaving this morning to go over to the church to you know get my assignment um, she said well can I go over to their house I'm like yeah that's fine so she goes over there, and then we met up laugh afterwards. She said we were only there till nine thirty, and then they had, I guess, they had hired a company or something to come in, and they didn't want them there. I'm like, okay, well, you know, I don't know. It's I to me, it just seems like if somebody's there willing to help you, let let them help. Um, but a lot of times, you can see that even in something like this, a lot of times people don't want they have a really hard time letting people 
help them. And here's the thing, everybody needs help sometimes. And especially, especially in a situation where your house floods, do not feel bad about, you know, big situations like that, where, you know, it's too much for anybody go, to go through alone. And it's not even just big things like that. I mean, when you're going through family issues, again, you don't have to go through that alone. I mean, ask for prayer, ask for advice. Um, you know, when you're isolated and you're just in, you know, on your own trying to work it out all by yourself, it's just sometimes, sometimes things are just too much to go through. And that's part of the reason, you know, that it's Paul tells us that not to forsake the gathering together of, um, as some people do. We're meant to be in community. We're meant to work as a body. So anyway, if you can keep my community in your prayers, as, um, not only not only just for the people who flooded, but also specifically for the people who um, are having a hard time letting people help them. We can be praying for, specifically for them. So anyway, so after today, this was, uh, I wanted to read this because this is, I don't know, this seems like the verse, the verse for today. So, you know, in Esther, it seemed like there was no way out. It seemed like there was no hope that they were facing certain destruction, but God made a way. And we have to remember that whatever our circumstances, our God is bigger and he will always make a way. So, and this is a verse that, that came to my mind today. Um, this is Isaiah 43. And starting in verse 1, But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your savior. So that's my verse for this coming week that whatever we're going through that God's with us and he will deliver us through it. So I hope you have a great weekend and a great next week and I am praying the blessings in favor of God for you and I'll see you next week.